Vladimir Putin's first visit to the West after he was elected president of Russia landed him in London in April 2000. There he was welcomed to 10 Downing Street by the then Prime Minister Tony Blair. Blair met with Putin many, many more times. We are back here in London with Tony Blair. Um, so it's a bit, the aging process <laughs> is a little bit visible from those old pictures. But anyway, not not, not of Putin, by the way, more of you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, what, what did you t tell us? You know, everyone is wondering about this question. He seemed rational, incremental, calculating, logical. He now seems emotional, um, you know, angry. Uh, what is your sense of the trajectory? So the, the first Putin I met was Western-facing, anxious to have a good relationship with the West. He used to insist that we met in St. Petersburg because it's the Western-facing great city of Russia. Then I think he, he found the challenges of reform and change in Russia too great, and he decided to consolidate power in a more autocratic way and then become a Russian nationalist. And so the second incarnation of Putin, if you like, was, was cold and calculating, and brutal, but still, I would say, entirely rational within his own terms. The anxiety I think everyone has is that he's now completely detached from reality, um, surrounded by people who won't tell him the truth. And this is why this, I mean, incredible miscalculation. Yeah. I mean, leave aside the, the, the wickedness of it. I mean, the miscalculation strategically and in every possible way has been enormous. I mean, how he could ever have thought, anyone who knows Ukraine, and we both know Ukraine, I mean, anyone who knows it, knows that there was never any question of Ukrainians agreeing to be subjugated to, to Russia in this way. So I think that's, that's the worry. The trajectory has been away from a reforming Western-oriented leader who could have allowed Russia to become part of the West. I mean, people even used to talk in the old days. I'm talking those, those times when I was there then. People were even talking about, could Russia become a member of the European Union? That's right. Is, was there a way Russia could be accommodated literally within the structures of NATO? And it's very important people remember this because th this myth that Putin perpetrates, that we were somehow always trying to push him and humiliate Russia, Russia's problem is not the result of our humiliation of Russia. It's as a result of bad government in Russia. Joe Biden says that his worry is that Putin is cornered and he doesn't have a way out. So what should the West and, you know, Ukraine do? It, it, should there be an active search for an off-ramp? Or are you of the view, let's first make sure that, that Ukraine kind of prevails in this and n not worry so much about giving Putin a face-saving way out? OK, so I think we've got to be guided by the Ukrainians and their leadership, because their leadership has been incredibly impressive. I don't just mean President Zelensky, but the others as well. But it's been impressive not merely by the courage, but they've showed a real intelligence about how they've approached it. And I think in the first weeks of this conflict, before it became extraordinarily brutal, I think they would have taken a way out and offered that off-ramp. But I think their attitude now, because of the, the way that Putin is trying to take that whole southern corridor and, and, and block Odessa, really, from, um, from, from Ukraine, I think now the Ukrainians will believe they've done well militarily, much better than anyone expected. They're going to get more support from the West. I think they will have to do much better than anyone expected. They're going to get more support from the West. I think they will have to choose the moment, if, the, if there is one, at which they, they look at the possibility of a negotiated settlement. But it's a lot harder to do now, because there is no way any Ukrainian leader is going to agree that Putin should get anything out of this invasion at all. Now, I do think there are larger issues. We were talking about them before around what is the type of security infrastructure, uh, architecture rather we need for, for the future relationship with Russia. But I don't, I don't favor pushing the Ukrainians into a premature negotiation, just as I wouldn't hold them back right. if they consider there is an optimum moment maybe after the summer months. And then you get to the game of what does the West ask for in return for the relaxation of sanctions, uh, which is presumably one of the key Russian demands is going to be. And it just strikes me that 
this is going to go on for a long time. That I don't, again, one of Putin's miscalculations is, I don't think this somehow magically all disappears. These sanctions have been put in place, the energy depend, the, the West is going to take its time rolling this back. So would you agree we're looking at a, a new world and that this is not going to get resolved in years? Yeah, I mean, 100 percent. And, and the thing is, you, you've got the sanctions, the actual legally enforceable sanctions, but then you've got a couple of other things. You've got, first of all, the fact that there's no one going to do business with Putin. And I think, is it a thousand companies have withdrawn from Russia? I don't think they're going to go back in whilst Putin remains in power. So that, that isolation, which is as much voluntary as it is mandated, will remain. And the second thing is that Europe, I mean, it's learned its lesson now. It will change its energy policy fundamentally to release itself from dependence on, on Russian oil and gas. Now, it may take some time in the case of gas and so on and so forth, but that's going to happen. It's absolutely inevitable because no one will want to be in a position, again, where there's any question of, of having a conflict between your what you need to do and your dependence on Russian energy. All right, before you, I let you go, I have to ask you, um, you were so instrumental in bringing stability to uh, Ireland, to Northern Ireland. Um, what does it mean that you now have a party in power there that um, in some ways is part of the old hope of a united Ireland? Is there now a possibility that Ireland and Northern Ireland will be united? Well, it's back on the agenda, let's say, in a way that it wasn't before. But the key immediate thing, because that's a, that's a whole longer term play, the key immediate thing is to get this dispute between the UK and the European Union resolved. It's very, very damaging. It really arises out of the fact that the UK entered into an agreement uh, back in October 2019 that it doesn't really want to keep to. And unsurprisingly, the Europeans are saying you do have to keep to it. I think there is a way through. There is a way through the technical and practical problems of how you organize trade between Britain, the island of Britain, and Northern Ireland. But it's going to require the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, will have to work out what he thinks is a sensible final negotiating position. And then he's going to have to go and sell it and persuade the European leaders. This is isn't going to get solved by the systems, not by the Commission system, not by the UK system. The only way you resolve something like this, and my experience of dealing with Europe, is to elevate it to the leaders' level and get it settled there. One more example of the, 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 the damage uh, to Britain that Brexit has caused. Well, you know, it was inevitable we would have this problem, because the moment you, you take the whole of the UK out of the single market and customs union of Europe, where, where we've been for um, four decades, then the, the hard external border of the European Union is between the north of Ireland and the south of Ireland. So it was always going to be a problem. And, you know, we just, look, it's happened, Brexit. Obviously, I disagree with it. We've got to make the best of it. But we need to resolve this, because otherwise we will put the, the union of the United Kingdom at risk. Tony Blair, always a pleasure. Thank you.